But you know, the Hubmobile had its presence and it was very, very exciting. But one of the things that really uh, caused a lot of tears in the exhibition were the hooked drugs. Uh, Julie Schoenecker loaned them and they had been made by her, her mother. When people read this label, you could almost be assured that they would uh, have to get out a handkerchief. Um, label says, my mother had a dream about making hooked rugs. But first, Julie's mother had to work as a dressmaker to support her children. For more than 20 years, she filled cardboard boxes with wool remnants in anticipation of her retirement. At 62, on the day she received her first Social Security check, she enrolled in a class to learn the craft of hooking rugs. She dyed the wool fabric, painstakingly cut it into one quarter inch strips, and then meticulously punched the strips through a woven backing on which she had drawn her own design. She was hoping to have a show of her work someday, but it never happened. She was 83 when she died. Just this kind of label sort of told the story as her daughter told it to us. It was very, very touching, very powerful. You look at the rugs. And you see how this woman had given her life to her children. But she wanted always to, to be able to hook rugs. And she still had 21 years to do this, but she never was able to show them to anyone. And this was the first time. So for the daughter, this was very meaningful, but for also for the view visitor to sort of sense what the, how the daughter and the mother must have felt about this. You know, it was just it was a really very powerful um, experience. The process of putting this exhibition together, I mean, it was always just, you know, there was always some new experience. Uh, it was wonderful to meet these people, talk with them. And one of the times I went over to Maui, um, the people at the center that were working on this, putting this exhibition together, um, said, you just got to come and meet the Cup Choys. We're, we're going to make another appointment for you. To, to, we've, we've already interviewed them. We want to use their part of their collection of salt and pepper shakers. But um, we want you to just have the experience of seeing their house and meeting them. And so we went, we went to visit them. And I was just totally, it was just like the most wonderful, unusual experience of, of my life to, to go there and see their house because in it there was just walls and walls of cupboards with hundreds, maybe thousands of salt and pepper shakers. Just everywhere you looked there were salt and pepper shakers. And they explained to me that n they had bought none of the salt and pepper shakers, that they had all been given to them by, generally by people whom they had um, helped in some way or other. But what the Cup Choys would often do, especially as early as the 70s when people were sort of living on or come and visit Hawa uh, Hawaii, uh, the hippie kind, kind uh, people, would they would camp the Cup Choys would see people camping on the beach and they would come and or go to them and say, you know, it's too dangerous to s stay here, come and stay at our house. And so they would, they would take the people to their home and um, put them up in their home and feed them. And it was their, uh, the Cup Choys were just this kind of generous, wonderful people. And so they would, they would um, constantly be bringing people there. And one of the first people that they um, put up, you know, after they left, uh, a few weeks later, they got this little package in the mail, and it was a set of salt and pepper shakers. And so when they went to, to 
find someone else at the beach. You know, they were talking and they said, oh, we got these salt and pepper shakers. So the next people sent them salt and pepper shakers. And then over the years, everyone just kept sending them these. And it was just this kind of expression of generosity on both on, you know, on both sides, the people that were visiting them and the cup choice. It was the, this, I mean, it was just such a beautiful uh, gesture. And so we tried to, um, to sort of reproduce or kind of give the feeling of that, um, of some one area of the house by constructing the um, shelving, shelves there with all the the uh, salt and pepper shakers assembled on them. Here we have a painting by Tadashi Sato that was loaned by Pandi Yokouchi, who is the sort of generator of the of the idea and and making the Maui Arts and Culture Center happen. When he first um, uh, started as a, a businessman on Maui uh, in real estate. He had, there was, had been an article in the Maui paper about Tadashi Sato and returning from New York City and um, uh, working as a painter. And so when Pundi got his first check, instead of going home with the check right away, he went to visit the Tadashi Sato. He ended up buying two paintings. He went home and told his wife what he did, and she was about ready to get rid of him. <laughs> not, he only he, not only the paintings, but get rid of him. <laughs> but he was so excited about it, because he just found Tadashi's work so incredible. And we ended up wanting to borrow one of those, because it kind of showed something very important. Um, it was it's one of the greatest works of art. I mean. Art with a capital A in the exhibition. But it showed a friendship, but it also showed the beginning of, a, of the career of a very important person who made the arts happen in Hawaii. He was the first uh, um, chairman of the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. Um, you know, great supporter of the arts, and without Pandiyoku Uchi, the Maui Arts and Culture Center would have never happened. 